Okay, I'll I'll get started in while Sushant joins. Uh, so yeah, today uh, what we thought we were going to talk about is the work that we are doing in Azure uh, as far as support for container networking is concerned. Uh, uh, let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. And that was Sushant, right? This is Anand, but I think Sushant is also trying to send some messages. Yes, yeah, Sushant, see it. Where are you? We can't hear you, Sushant. OK, Sushant, jump I, in. Uh, um, I think it's star six if you're having issues on the phone. Yeah. Okay, let me let me start, and then as Sushant joins, he can jump in. So Sushant is 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 a developer on container networking in in my team uh, in Azure networking. So uh, so he's put together these slides to update us on on the work that we are doing in container networking. Uh, so today, what we thought we will cover is is support for container network policies in uh, in Azure. Uh, uh, as you may already remember from some of the past discussions, Azure networking supports uh, uh, overlays or what we call virtual networks for containers. When you deploy Kubernetes containers uh, in Azure, they can already be deployed into Azure virtual networks, uh, get IP addresses in the private space, uh, talk among each other, as well as talk to VMs and on-premise resources uh, through, through the Azure virtual network stack that is already available for VMs and now for containers. So what uh, we are going to talk about today is how we are enhancing uh, this virtual network for containers uh, to support uh, policies. And the component we are going to talk about is Azure Network Policy Manager. Okay, my slide is not moving forward. Okay. Okay, so the policy manager uh, will support Kubernetes policies natively. So essentially, uh, however you specify the Kubernetes policies through YAML, uh, the policy manager will plug seamlessly into Kubernetes such that uh, we support the, the same policy language specification uh, uh, that Kubernetes specifies. Uh, this uh, will be open source. Uh, it will be stateless. It does not require any store or state replication uh, as part of Kubernetes. And uh, we will support both, both Linux and Windows. And Shant, if you if you're able to join, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, or let me know and I'll hand off to you. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Sorry, okay. Look, I don't know what's wrong with my volume, uh, my mic, probably. Yeah, so you can, you can continue from now on. So I covered the overview slide. Uh, why don't you you continue okay. with the slide? Right? I, I, the slides are, do you want me to present my screen? Or That's okay, I can. I can stay in touch with, with you speaking. Uh, so, so next one is the architecture slide uh, where we show uh, what type of, uh, we, uh, we are handling all the, all the three type of events that Kubernetes sends to the policy manager. Uh, for example, wait. whenever- can't wait. Something is, is wrong with PowerPoint. Just one second. I don't know why it's, I'll just stay in this. Yeah, continue. Yeah, so uh, we have event handlers basically using the, uh, so, uh, so we have three type of event handlers, uh, all three that uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, sends us events for. Uh, for example, like whenever a pod is created, updated or deleted, um, or a namespace is created, uh, or whenever a customer updates the policy YAML file, uh, adds new policies in there. Um, so we we have so we have uh, event handlers for all of these events, 
and this policy manager is implemented as a daemon set following the the kubernetes uh, guidelines of how to write a policy manager and uh, basically what we use uh, is the combination of ip tables and ip set um, and uh, to implement uh, any any kind of policy specified in the in the yaml um, for linux and for windows we use something called windows virtual filtering platform um, you can think of it as a analogous to ip tables in linux um so so that's about the overview of uh, what we do uh, if you want to look at the details uh, next slide it, it just says what i what i just talked about it just um, uh, basically whatever i just said using client go is the is the one we use to register for the callbacks from kubernetes uh, if you want to look into more details uh, in the in the next in the next slide Uh, we have details on how how it is implemented um, as as a, as a completely stateless. So we don't save any any of the state. Uh, we rely on the the Kubernetes callbacks. So let's say the policy manager uh, crashes or restarts. Uh, we when we register for the events, Kubernetes sends us uh, whatever is the current current state uh, regarding the policies in the in the node should be, and uh, we we work off of that. so how it is implemented is basically uh, in the forwarding chain of the ip table filter table um we in we, we forward all the uh, all the whatever packet comes we process it first through the azure npm chain which is basically a just a, uh, the chain that we create uh, so that all whatever we do is constrained within one chain and within there uh, that chain we have a separate Chains again for ingress and egress policies, and uh, I don't know how much detail should I go, but let let me go for the little bit more. So so in the in the policy YAML, um, I think it's my speaker. So in in the policy YAML, there are uh, you can specify policies based on uh, pod labels or uh, like namespace label and uh, namespace names. So what we do is we create an IP set. for uh, every pod label uh, which helps us in reducing the number of ip table rules that we need to add uh, whenever a new pod uh, gets added to a certain label we just update the ip set and none of the existing rules need to be changed so that's one thing we use uh, and then um, for every uh, so in the policy yaml also the policies are based on ports like uh, like so like http port tcp protocol so port and protocol com combination along with every ip set we have one rule for that and then we forward that uh, the same thing for ingress and egress for both chains we forward those packets uh, depending on which uh, port and protocol and ip set it matches uh, to another uh, for ingress we create a new chain called ingress from and for egress similarly we have another change uh, egress to. and then uh, basically we start by uh, basically we start by rejecting <clears throat> by adding the reject rule uh, uh, and then we in, in uh, so the first two rules are for the ip blocks so the way ip blocks work is uh, you can specify what what ip blocks uh, to accept ex, uh, to accept packets from except you can specify some exceptions so we start by specifying the exceptions and rest we accept and then similarly then it goes through the namespace so namespace selector label is also like an ip set and uh, we ex if if it falls the ip address falls within the ip set for the namespace uh, we uh, we accept it and similarly for the pod selector and uh, what happens is whenever uh, we get a callback for like a new pod gets created in a certain namespace we update we keep on updating the ip sets uh, and these rules we add once whenever a new uh, namespace comes or a new uh, pod label comes we update the rules once we know what the people i told them that Something. I'm sorry. Uh, did anyone say said something? Uh, so, anyways, so so these rules we uh, add once, and whenever uh, a new pod gets created, we do not change the rules. We just update the IP set, and uh, and and it's pretty uh, performant uh, because we don't uh, touch the IP tables again and again for creation of new pods. Um, uh, I can also give a quick demo. on uh, uh, like a quick demo that we have prepared uh, 
So, Sushant, okay. I can hand off the control to you. So, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen. So I'll share my screen. I am connecting it to another. So this is, uh, uh, I'm connected to the master of uh, one of our uh, Kubernetes clusters. So I'm gonna show you all the pods that are there in the cluster right now. Uh, so let me. Let me clean up uh, some of the namespaces we have. So while it is, yeah. Okay, so the cleanup is done. Let me open another connection. And so, okay, so we are clean. Uh, only cube system pods um, are running. Let me let me deploy three namespaces. So what I'm going to do in the demo is I'm going to create uh, three different namespaces and pods in uh, those three namespaces. Uh, and I'm gonna first I'm gonna show that these namespaces can can reach e each other. So right now, for example, we have three namespaces: NS1, NS2, and NS3. And there are some pods there. They're still getting created. So once they are created, we'll get the IP addresses for them. And Sushant, these IP addresses are from Azure VNet, right? These yes, are all these are from the Azure VNet. That's correct. So these pods uh, in these three namespaces are directly connected to Azure VNet. They can reach on-prem, uh, express route, uh, all service endpoints work. Uh, if you have like a storage or a SQL service endpoint somewhere running in the Azure, you can reach that uh, from these pods. Uh, so, the, so these are the NS1, NS2. So let me. Uh, let me connect to uh, a pod in one of the namespace, like let's pick oh, in NS3. Let's see what policy I'm going to pick. Yeah. yeah. So I have a YAML that allows from NS1 to NS3. So let me connect to one of the pod in namespace 2, and I'll show that I can reach. Uh, from NS3, I can reach uh, NS2, and uh, from NS2, I can reach NS3. Uh, but when I apply the policy YAML that only allows NS123, that communication will break. So uh, let me connect to. Okay, so uh, I am in the I am in the pod. Uh, so these are nginx. Uh, all these pods are running nginx. So I am in one of the pods in namespace two. And uh, let's pick one of the IP addresses from namespace three, and uh, we should be able to reach that now because right now I have not applied any policies. Okay, so we can get something from the nginx that's running. So now let me apply the the policy. Can you show the policy, uh, Sushant? Uh, um, so it's a very simple policy that says uh, apply it on the namespace three. Uh, this policy needs to apply on namespace three, and by default everything is blocked unless you specify something in that policy YAML to be allowed. And if you look at the ingress, ingress part of the policy, we can say any namespace that match labels of namespace NS one, uh, only that will be allowed. So it's it's one of the we have like we support everything that Kubernetes supports, but for the demo purpose we have a simple uh, simple one. So I'm going to apply this uh, policy. Okay, so this policy is applied and now because it only allows from name says one, two, three, this this kind of communication is now broken from namespace uh, two to three, and I can remove this policy and it will start working. And it will start working. So I can apply again, 
and it will stop working. See, and I can remove again, and it will start working again. So it is like I said, it's pretty performant. Uh, uh, the, the, there is almost no lag between when we apply the policies and when the data path uh, starts working on it, and we uh, support it natively in cloud. Uh, I think we are the first uh, public clouds to uh, public cloud to actually support the Kubernetes policies natively. Uh, so, so, so that was the demo, and uh, we were also hoping if we can uh, discuss in this forum uh, whether we can because right now the policies we can only have these actors like port and IP address based what to block, what to not to block. Uh, but we were hoping to discuss here if if there is enough forum on in this forum to uh, to further enhance this to maybe include some routes uh, because those are also the policies that generally customers want in in public cloud uh, routing their packets via force tunneling or or some kind of more richness in the policy so I, i'll let deepak take over and and maybe he has uh, something to add to it yeah so like uh, uh, like sushant was saying uh, in Azure VNet today for VMs, we support a wide array of policies. Uh, security groups is, is, is certainly one, one of it that you just saw. But in addition, we also support uh, capabilities for service chaining. Uh, that's something that we call routes is what enables customers to specify policy to forward traffic from one, uh, uh, from, from one part another uh, part and say, hey, go through to this appliance uh, in between. So, uh, so routes is, is, is one such policy uh, that, that we are considering enhancing uh, the Kubernetes policy specification with. Uh, another one is around load balancing and DNS, right? Uh, we support rich load balancing policies. Uh, and similarly, we support uh, rich capabilities around DNS. Uh, uh, and then remote connectivity to on-premise. So, uh, uh, so, so right now, uh, while security groups are possible, uh, uh, we would like to extend uh, the YAML specification to include policy specification for these other scenarios that are possible with virtual machines but are not possible with Kubernetes containers today. The other thing, uh, this is Anand, by the way. Uh, the, the other thing I'd like to add to what Deepak said, I don't know how much of a policy definition uh, change in the annual will result in, but there is a lot of uh, uh, you know value add and also providing an integrated experience where the uh, Kubernetes policies or, or you know or any container policy coexists with the uh, Azure VNet policies that we have. If we can use we use labels back and forth. Uh, or you know you can use tags back and forth between the two environments. Uh, that is very useful in hybrid scenarios where customers want to go from a VNet to a cluster or from a cluster to a VNet. Yes, yeah, so I definitely I think um, you know our group would definitely want to continue talking about the service chaining, the load balancing, and the DNS extension pieces for sure. Those are kind of the top three. Areas along with like IPv6 is like a fourth area that we want to definitely take forward into the work group to try to define some extensions we want to suggest. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, we would love to work work with you all to to, uh, to define those. Yeah. The, the last thing that was just mentioned with the um, the labels is this is this kind of going to like a custom defined label that can be you know mapped or are you are you suggesting something different than that yes so so we support two kinds of labels one is what we call system labels which are to identify azure services and another is to we support custom defined labels which customers can can put labels on on, on any part of their their containers or workloads so yes both of those uh, we would like to uh, to be available to the customers to use with containers I think definitely that those those topics would be um, something we should definitely. If you guys have like some um, something you could present, you can you know if you want to get together with with me, with me 
come up with some type of like a you know definition we want to present to the work group or if you guys have something you want to present we should definitely entertain that in the next you know one of the next meetings coming up sure sure i think we would love to uh, give us uh, maybe uh, uh, we'll probably will won't be ready for the next meeting but the meeting after that uh, we should be ready so uh, how about we tentatively put us down uh, uh, four weeks out uh, so next month uh, uh, for us to present uh, at least an initial uh, proposal on on routes and maybe load balancer Okay. And I'll set up some time with you guys in the next maybe in two weeks to kind of have some discussions, with, you know, just between a smaller group of us. Yeah, that would be that would be great. I'll work with you on that, Deepak. Yes, yes, uh, that would be great, Ken. Uh, that would be awesome. Uh, one question I had was uh, uh, how, as a community, how do we want to approach this uh, with respect to? PNCF, uh, this working group, and uh, the network SIG group in Kubernetes, right? Do we do we expect us to take our joint work together to to Kubernetes network SIG, or do we expect the two communities to be one and same only? How, how do we see that happening? Yeah, for for the most part, we have, um, and I think this week Brian is um, is on vacation, but we usually have Brian join us from the the CNI. Um, contributors group and I don't know if we have anyone on here from the the network SIG but we usually have one or two people from Google join representing the network SIG this meeting so I don't know if they were able to make it today or not okay, I yeah sure. we, we sort of collaborate together and um, you know whatever you know whatever we bring forward as a proposal from here we would we'd probably present it to the TOC in the CNC app and then from there work through um, you know through the different um, um, whether it's a CNI request or whether it's a Kubernetes request we would work with the appropriate groups collaboratively on that. Sounds great. Yeah that sounds great. And then the, the last question I had for the for the Azure team is is there any interest in um, you know you said your policy manager was open source um, is there any interest in presenting um, all or any part of your policy manager to the CNCF? Yeah, we, we would love to, we would love to, uh, uh, what, uh, what would you like to see covered in, in, in that presentation, uh, detailed architecture, um, uh, uh, or, uh, or more code level structure, uh, uh we would love your guidance on, on what you would like to see presented there. Yeah, I can, I would definitely provide that to you. And I, I think it, it's probably more along the lines of, um, you know, specifically the policy pieces and the extensions and how, how we have an implementation to show kind of how that works. So kind of show the running code and an example of, you know, how the policy definition works. So I, we'll, we'll talk more about it offline, but yeah, I think that's, that's sort of along the lines of what I was thinking. Sounds great. Sounds great. And and the main reason for us to open source is to have the community participate and contribute to it. So so certainly uh, uh, we would love to to present and get the the community feedback and 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 participation. Sure, definitely. Awesome. I'll get you. I'll talk with Chris to get you scheduled. It'll probably be um, a month out or so given the diamond on the TLC, but I'll let, we'll definitely work with you guys on when we, when you can present and when they're able to fit you in. Okay, thanks. Cool. All right, I don't see Alexis. Is there anybody from WeaveWorks joined? All right, well, before I jump on to the next agenda item, um, do you guys have any questions for, um, for the Microsoft team? Thanks, uh, Deepak and uh, Shushant and get the other individual that joined, but thanks for your um, for the presentation and the overview of, of the work you've done on the policy manager and the different policies you've been um, working on. Any questions from anyone on the call? No comments? Quiet group today. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, so the um, 
the next piece of the agenda. I'm sorry, does somebody want to say something? Okay. Um, so the the next agenda item was around um, part of the work group charter was um, you know looking at the the networking space and on the um, and the landscape that the, the CNCF has put together. There's quite a few companies that they've sort of and projects that they've sort of put into the network space. Um, of of those projects, I know WeaveWorks has um, presented to the TOC and is interested in becoming an official um, CNCF uh, network project. And so, um, one of the things I've asked them to do is come and present to this working group, and and I'll try to get that scheduled maybe for the next um, the next meeting. Um, uh, but you know, part of what we want to try to do, I think, is start looking at some of the network projects out there, especially in the areas that you know we discussed previously, in you know the low balancing piece, the um, you know thinking about some of the um, services that are needed in network IPv6 type of services. You know, looking at, at projects that are addressing those areas and, and reaching out to those projects to talk about what the cloud native aspects would look like. In those projects so um, so I definitely open for anyone on this um, call to, to look at those companies and you know suggest ones that might be of interest um, that are filling a gap in the cloud native ecosystem today that we should talk to same thing with like monitoring tools you know there's, a, there's other sort of like Areas that are kind of complementary to network, but are not in the network space that we probably should broaden scope um, of the discussion to as well. That are kind of complementary to what networking is is providing to the cloud native infrastructure. Yeah, Ken, I, I agree. Um, this is Lee. Um, uh, well, a couple of thoughts. One is um, so so yeah. So Weave is intending to propose. Um, net uh, for adoption. I, I spoke with the, Alexis uh, uh, reached out a couple of times um, kind of asking for uh, project management there. I, I've just not had the bandwidth to engage but but we've had them present uh, or that, that project present on this working group I, I think at least once in the past right? Yeah we did. Uh, not that not that it doesn't make sense to do it again, but just kind of recollecting. Um, you know, speaking of like mon related monitoring tools and like uh, sort of uh, opening up scope is like well, uh, actually, <laughs> actually scope we scope is uh, uh, certainly very you know yeah. microservices visual topology oriented. Definitely, um, yeah, I agree. I, I brought that up with Alexis in the past as well. <laughs> Um, there's other things particularly around, like, you know, I guess there's a couple of ways that this particular work group could go. One being um, uh, somewhat service provider oriented in um, nature. And I think we've seen, you know, FD, FD.io and, and some of that flavor of projects. And much of what's in the CNCF and, and our the general focus is much more inside the data center and kind of uh, enterprise and you know end user oriented um so i'm happy to yep. like, suggest things more toward that and so some of those things are like uh, service mesh is, a, is a, a decent topic probably not lots of kind of um education to happen in that area uh, lots yep. of interesting projects in that area very interesting you know um we don't you know uh, other other things maybe are around, um, and I actually just missed um, Deepak's presentation, so I don't know if that was, um, I think Deepak had presented before as well, I, if I recollect it was around um, Microsoft's perspective on enhanced network policies and, uh, and really sort of in context of Kubernetes policies, but that, that's certainly, there's lots of like QoS and sort of other higher level network services that you know, probably yet to be, you know, yet to be addressed. So. I don't know if any of that helps, uh, sort, of, sort of riffing here on some, some things. I know from my, my part, I've had a heavy focus towards service mesh over the last 
um, you know, six months or so. Right. Uh, yeah. So Lee, I think it's definitely a good topic. So I go ahead and depart. Yeah, I was saying, Lee, what we presented today was more around uh, security groups and, and isolation. Um, and and before you joined Ken and, and we talked about uh, qua, uh, talked about DNS, load balancing, IPv6 as some of the topics. I think QAS is a good one that we should add to the list as well. I agree. Yeah. Got it. Did you guys know the state of IPv6 uh, that, that, you know, more or less Cisco is kind of, you know, thinking, help trying to steward within the Kubernetes network state? Is that like, is that... So, so what, what, what was your question around IP? Kind of the state of uh, IPv6 support in Kubernetes. Uh, no, we haven't looked at that, but that's certainly one area that we want to look at next. You know, there's, a big, uh, there's a big disconnect um, in sort of the, the, the efforts that are going on with IPv6 and the vendor's ability to support them right now, as you probably know, Lee. So that's something that... I'm, I'm very interested in sort of helping to, um, especially from the end user standpoint, right? If we can have a strong end user voice back to, to the community oh. space, I think it would be very beneficial to, I know my being a little bit, you know, selfish like you, I've been spending a lot of time in this space and it MasterCard being a um, transaction network, we have no IPv4 at all. And we rely on IPv6 or out of space completely. And, um, Every you know every transaction and every place in the world has an IP address associated with it. And so we're trying to you know we're trying to really get our vendors to understand that IPv6 isn't an option for us. <laughs> so <laughs> and none of them support it. It's all in their roadmap, and it's it's um, even even like working with some of the cloud solutions out there today. They're all IPv4, and you know IPv6 isn't part of their capabilities yet. So. I think it's a big area that we can help drive. So if you want to give an update to the, to the working group on, on what Cisco is doing with the Kubernetes thing, that would be really good, I think. I, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I'm ignorant. I, don't, uh, I, just, I just recognize that uh, you know, some of our former cohorts are there uh, uh, being active, but I haven't kept pace. Um, you know, that, that's interesting. So you guys are, yeah, you're having to traverse the IPv6, IPv4 stack uh, as you guys communicate outside your networks. And then, yeah, if you go to try, try to use really any of the public cloud um, services, you've got, you've got that translation challenge. So I think we've shown, and, and Ken, as you steward the serverless working group as well, we've shown, uh, and I don't know that this is going to happen all that often, but, but at least with cloud events, um, you know, a lot of hesitancy and reservation on the public, you know, the, the lead of public clouds behalf AWS to really um, partake and adopt, but certain, like almost the peer pressure at this point um, right. might pay off. So yeah, to the extent that, you know, we were to gain enough mass around IPv6 that might. Yeah, definitely. We can push, definitely want to push for that. So, yeah, certainly. I think, Ken, your comments on IPv6 requirement is very useful, even for us in Azure, because, like you said, uh, customers uh, need to ask for it. I, I don't think there is broad awareness. Like, we, I know we have run out of IP addresses ourselves, just like you said. And, and so, at an infrastructure level, we've been moving towards IPv6, but uh, as far as exposing it to customers is something that we have been trading quite slowly, partially because customers haven't been coming out to us and saying they must uh, they must have IPv6. So it would be good to to get that input uh, uh, from you over to to Azure as well. Definitely. So I can. So I definitely. Um... Service mesh is one of these things I've been wanting to kind of have a discussion on. So I might see if I can align something up for for two weeks from from today for a service mesh discussion because I think it's it's very interesting. I'll start working on an IPv6 one with uh, with my friends at Cisco. See if I can get somebody from the this driving that um, lead to join us and kind of give us a briefing on what's what's going on there. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, we never really, we never, I, I don't know that we necessarily, 
ever came back to, you know, Ken, I don't know what your, your appetite is in this working group to potentially take on a bit of a white paper, maybe like, and maybe this would be more evident after we kind of have a, a service mesh discussion, but mm -hmm. lots of, lots of, you know, particularly with respect to API gateways, lots of overlap in, uh, like on, on paper, when you read down the features list, it's like, well, these, these two things do the same thing. And, and so what's the difference? So why, why is it like, anyway, there's just the, right. Like, you know, hey, I, I've got a container orchestrator. It, it does uh, health checks and uh, load balancing and, uh, you know, why, and firewalling. Like, why do I, you know, like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's... No, I, I think that's a um, very important, um, very important point, right? And I, if within the serverless work group, right, we, we kind of identified a, a white paper topic right and, and went after that. and i think and you're right and in, in our working group i'd like to and it doesn't have to be one like with serverless it was really more of about just how we kind of position serverless and function as a service and, and what it means to cloud native and to platform as a service and that kind of stuff right i think in the in the, in the networking work group, we probably want to have a couple of different white papers that may be more along the lines of the different services that we are, you know, trying to like kind of highlight from an end user community are important services that have, you know, gaps today in the delivery and the execution of, you know, to do things in a cloud native way today. So, so I definitely would like, I don't know, I don't have an idea of what that proposal is yet. Um, but I think once we talk about some of the, the different services that we want to look at adding as extensions to, um, for cloud native and we look at you know service mesh we look at ipv6 and we look at qos and maybe a few other topics to come out of those discussions i think well to your point um i agree with you lee we'll have a much better view of if we were to do a white paper what would we do it on and if would we do one it would we do like two different white papers we can yeah. figure that out later but yeah just just even as a you know we might even be a good litmus test just even as a group of insiders and and as we go to grok the right you know the answer to some of those questions <laughs> yeah part of, you know at one point the cncf had a um i hate i don't know if i have the right word i call it as a test bed we had like a you know super nap had provided some you know servers and um you know it, um, Joyent, before they were acquired, had, you know, put some resources on kind of building out a, an environment where we could actually host and test out projects and ideas and have them interoperate together st and stuff like that. And that all died because of different reasons. But I still think it, you know, there's enough, um, there's enough interest here. And especially if, if our working group has enough interest in, in doing something there, um, you know, I know from talking with Dan and the CNCF that they'll definitely provide, you know, resources to work with us, you know, whether it's doing a white paper, whether it's um, getting access to some kind of a, an environment that we can test out some of these, you know, ideas or, you know, for, for that matter, a lot of the, the things that you we're talking about here, I have up and running in different environments today that I could, you know, at least provide results if I couldn't give access to them, but I could at least provide results and take input on what things you want to see tested and maybe get those things tested quickly and provide the results of the test. But yeah, one of those, yeah, you know, actually on that now, yeah, that's funny that you mentioned it because um, I put in a proposal for some time on the cluster. Yeah, I think that's what we were calling it, CNCF cluster. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the proposal was around uh, performance testing of various uh, container network drivers. Um, yeah. And you know, like there's some natural expectations that overlays bear some amount of overhead, but, but even at that, like, uh, like various host level network, you know, just the various drivers of the same genre are still, you know, had different implementations and, um, you know, that like, as a matter of fact, uh, this might even be something good for us to take a look at on this call. I'm going to put yeah. the link in the chat. It is a free tool that, that we had created um, at SolarWinds at about that time to, it was really created with that use case in mind that it was going to facilitate kind of 
uh, throughput tests, kind of performance tests across different networks, kind of like an iPerf, but in a pretty way and helps you kind of compare the, um, as a matter of fact, there's a little bit of like uh, some weave scope type visualization in here. It's been a while since we've updated it, but um, I get around, I don't know. If, if folks want to take a look at just maybe the screenshot on the page, um, and uh, get a sense of whether or not a demo or just anybody has want to talk about this and uh, maybe Yeah, I definitely think it'd be worth talking about for sure. I mean, it's a weave scope is, a, you know, has gotten so much more time put into it than this necessarily has, but this is kind of, this is like a diluted version of that. And so, yeah. Okay. All right. um, but, but I bring this up, Ken, mostly to reinforce the point that you were making about like, um, hey, various um, at scale uh, reports or, or tests, like, um, or at least, you know, I, I know that as and when we were focused really heavily on CNI, um, the various network drivers there, which one to use and why, and um, baking them off was, a, was kind of the, why this project was created. I like it. We'll definitely get us something scheduled to talk through this. And okay. uh, I, I do think there's, you know, work groups within the CNCF um, have have some flexibility still to kind of define what are some of the um, outcomes that we want to define and then what sort of um, yeah. you know, requests we want to take back to the CNCF in terms of having an environment for doing things or having you know a tech writer to work with us to help you know document you know a white paper for instance or um, I'm not completely clear on the whole CNI integration or engagement piece yet that's something I need to kind of still work out with the TLC but um, I, I still feel like we have the ability to kind of request you know update yeah. CNI with here are some some things that we think are gaps and in the specification, they may not, you know, accept them, but I think it's still our scope to kind of define things that, that we see as missing or, or needed. Yeah, yeah I totally. I uh, hate to receive, you know, an update every so often, and then to, yeah, allow space for suggestion on, yeah, on, on gaps they might fill. Right, well, Everyone, thank you for, for joining today. I will, um, I have a nice, I was hoping to get a nice list of topics for the next couple of months and I, you guys have helped me successfully fill out more than enough things for us to talk about for the next few months. And so I'll get a, I'll get, I'll update the um, TOC page. I haven't updated that in a while. So I'll get that updated with these agenda items and get a schedule together and get speakers lined up to come and speak with us. And, um, each meeting will try to have a presentation and also, you know, knock off some of these tactical discussions we want to have as well. So maybe 20 minutes on presentation, 20 minutes on, you know, tactical next steps and of, of discussions like we had today, and then, you know, leave 20 minutes for, you know, new topics or open items we want to discuss. So. Nice. Right. Thanks yeah. everyone. Have a great, uh, great rest of your day and rest of your week. All right. Cheers. See you guys. Bye, Ken.